Hello everyone, Randy Harrington here. Uh, I'm going to bring you a video tonight describing a happening that came to a head back in 2012-2013 with a guy named Ed Smith. Uh, maybe some of you old timers might remember the uh, Daisy in a Box uh, situation that involved an Ed Smith uh, and the MABRC. At the time, I was uh, the right-hand man at the top of the MABRC. I'd been there since the beginning. <clears throat> so uh, had a four-year relationship with this gentleman and met him. So I'm going to lay out the whole timeline, but I'm going to start by reading what happened at the end <clears throat> of this four-year stretch. I'm going to give you an explanation of everything that happened in the four years prior to this, but I'm going to read a, a, a posting that was made at the very end of this relationship and how things culminated at the end. So buckle up. Okay, this is the post in 2012 that started the end of the big brouhaha. And this was from Ed Smith himself. He says, I understand that I am no longer a member of the original six in its new form. All of my access to the database and the communication nexus were removed, I thought. But today he received a text from the flash list routing server. The text is as follows. December 27th, 2012, 10.09 a.m. from the Sync six as of nine oh six twenty seventh of December two thousand twelve. Daisy is in the box. Now, this is what Ed said after that. I believe this message is factually correct because when we refer Bigfoot while under observation, we use the term target. The designation was to change to Daisy once captured. This was never published or posted. CINC is capture control and six is the chief or lead. No one else would have known this. Plus the routing and IP information matched. I believe that Quantra has a live specimen. If this is correct, then I congratulate them on a job well done. Ed Smith. All right. So then after that, he said... Uh, So here's what I know. Daisy has been moved to a, an examination area about 12 miles from the capture site at 317 this morning after being properly sedated. The capture site and examination area are on private property, leased or owned in order to conduct research and operations of this type. This was confirmed by a source in the Quanta group. Here is what I know. I don't know the weight, height, hair color, gender, or location of capture, or the health of the specimen, nor the actions leading up to the capture of the specimen. Here's what I'm speculating. The examination team is continuing to assemble. Examination should take about 72 hours. If they go by the plan, then a decision about release or storage in a repository will be made with all four, with, within 48 hours after the examination is completed. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I, I'm, you know, you guys can stop the videos and read these as you would like, uh, you know, to to go over the details yourself. But this is the this is the big one that once this was received, that there was uh, quite the circus atmosphere where everyone snatched a hold of it and thought, OK, folks, this is it. So I am going to lay out the timeline and the story of meeting Ed, the four year relationship up to this point and everything involved and and how, you know, we could get into something like this at the time could we thought could be believable. All right, here we go. So so now I'm going to go ahead and lay out my version of events where I met Ed Smith. Uh, you guys can do your own homework if you're willing to. You can go back onto the Bigfoot forums and look up Ed Smith, Teen Quantra, the original six. Uh, 
Daisy in a Box. That was the code name for the capture of a Bigfoot. And this is going to be me telling my version of uh, me meeting Ed Smith. And, uh, you know, it started out to where he just became a member of the MABRC and uh, was uh, just uh, being a part of discussions and uh, making observations and comments. And, uh, you know, as as one of the top people at the MABRC, uh, one of the things that we did there, and, and it, it's kind of funny, but uh, we we looked at people's personal messages. Uh, there were uh, DW set it up to where we could watch, we could we could read people's messages to, back and forth to each other. That allowed us. I mean, he's going to act like it that I was doing it on my own, but that is not that is not the truth whatsoever. Uh, we had lots of conversations. We were able to nip problems in the bud. Uh, before they would unfold because it would start with personal conversations where somebody would reach out to somebody else and start to cause flack and and and, and cause chaos so that allowed us to just stay on top of uh you know keep keep uh, a thumb on top of things so we had access to the personal messages i'm not a tech guy i'm i'm not the uh, network tech guy like dw was he's the one that set this all up clearly knew that we were uh, listening to people's reading people's personal messages. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. That is a fact. Uh, but uh, so we were able to, I was able to see uh, Ed making comments to people, trying to uh, l give them pointers and uh, suggestions on research techniques and, and things to use. And, and he had a lot of insight and, it was telling us that uh, here's here's somebody that knows what he's doing. And so we developed a friendship and he started posting more and more on the forum. And we had lots of phone conversations. And after I'm going to let you listen to some audio where I was the uh, I was the host of the show. And uh, I'm going to let you listen to my interview of Ed. And we're going to talk about some things and I will interject when I need to. Uh, but tonight, we have a very special guest. Uh, is he up yet? No, not yet. Okay, uh, he's still trying to log in, but uh, our guest tonight is Ed Smith. Uh, we have had a couple of shows with Ed Smith on it before. One was a follow-up show. I believe you had a follow-up show with him. Okay, no follow-up shows, just the original show with Ed Smith. Okay, so everyone is, is fully aware of, of Ed Smith and the original six his his crew his his uh, his group of gentlemen that uh, have been doing their research and studies for ten years now. Uh, you know they started out with a ten year plan, got together, you know, and decided to put some money into this research, and uh, they ha they always had a ten year plan. They have gone beyond that ten year plan right now uh, by I don't know a year and a half or so, so it's more like eleven years now. Uh, so I know Ed is very anxious to to reach the end of this. Uh, you know, it's been a lot of work. I've developed a friendship with Ed. We've spoken quite a bit, quite extensively on the, on the phone. And uh, so I, I have quite a bit of insight on, on their research and, and where he's been and, and what they've done. Uh, and I've been excited about it ever since he uh, came to the MABRC forum and started uh, sharing some of their research and, and looking for uh, anyone who could uh, document some of the things that they were coming up with in the field as that would be needed to, to further scientific uh, looking into this is by having something verified and, and, and done again in, in the field elsewhere uh, that would match what they've got. Uh, all right, man. This has been rough tonight, Ed. Uh, <laughs> to say okay. that, I, I know you've been trying like mad to get in on your end and yeah. technical difficulties on this end. I think it all stems from the fact that we have little to no cell phone coverage out here, and it is taking everything hours to download when we need something to pop up quickly. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to – I've jotted down a few questions. And, you know, I think what's important about the, the radio show tonight is everyone has had a chance to go through the archive show that we've done with you in the past, and there was so much information on that, that radio show that everybody is, is very anxious to, to see 
come to fruition and uh, and see where, where this has has ended up. Uh, you know as well as I that uh, a couple of years ago when you you came forward with your with your group and <clears throat> was were, were looking to share information, you know some things happened and, and people got a little anxious and and a little jumped the gun and you guys pulled back a little bit. Could you describe your ten year plan and how you came up with the ten year plan and, and and how you stepped forward in a couple of years ago and then you pulled back and the reasons for pulling back because I think a lot of people get a little impatient and you know we're we're in these this fast food world where you want it now and you got to have it now uh and, and people were expecting to, to hear these great things from you and then when you pulled back i think there was a lot of, lot of disappointment and you know and I'm, it's nothing on your end because you have a plan and, and you, you're still following through with your plan so if you would can you can you explain to our listeners how you and your group came up with a 10-year plan and and how you you know came to bring that information forward a couple of years ago Okay, well, back in the late 90s is when we kind of resolved to to step off and try and do something as far as, um, you know, anything meaningful from what, what we would consider meaningful uh, as far as research and as also investigation. So Okay, now, from the very beginning... And I learned this through myself and Ed's friendships and our conversations that there was a group of six friends that all went to college together. And uh, Ed is involved with a trust fund situation where he where he he gets some trust fund money. And I think it's doled out to him every year. Uh, At least that was my understanding. And uh, the other gentlemen are all educated, college degrees. Uh, one or two of them were lawyers, uh, businessmen. Uh, and I think one of them uh, was in the oil fields or oil wells. So we're talking about a, a cluster of friends uh, w- with a substantial amount of income, uh, disposable income to, to put towards this process. And it was my understanding that uh, at some discussion that they were having uh, turned towards the discussion of Bigfoot and because Ed had an encounter. Uh, And I think it it was when he was in college. So uh, having a discussion with these other uh, young men, come to find out four of the six guys had personal encounters Bigfoot encounters. So that was the beginning of wow. Uh, you know, what are the odds that a group of a group of friends, you know, with all like-minded friends, all had encounters? And so I think that's where the seed was sown to try to do something different and sink some real money and science, uh, you know, and technology into this uh, subject to 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 get it, you know, discovered. And uh, so that was the beginnings. And I do know uh, Ed told me of his encounter and how that happened on the Illinois River in Oklahoma. Uh, he said he uh, he had hiked out one 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 night and was uh, was camping on a bluff uh, along the Illinois River. And he said it was the next morning that he got up early and was hiking back along the the, the Illinois River. And he said going through some river reed or something. Uh, two creatures popped up like like they had laid down, were, were taking a nap or bedded down or something. But uh, he was hiking out and two of them popped up in, in the river reed that he was wading through and it spooked him really bad. And uh, he said he backed out into the shallow water. You know, the river at that point was you know maybe only three foot deep. Uh, gravel bed where he could walk you could walk and he said he walked out facing them as he was you know just trying to figure out what was going on and he said one of them came out into the water and followed him for a while and the other one followed up on the shore and it spooked him really bad Uh, eventually he put some distance between them you know they, they gave him his space and he he got enough distance and you know as the day wore on and he got further away 
the distance got further and further till he didn't see him anymore. So, so maybe they were escorting him out or maybe they were just, you know, maybe they felt like they were intimidating him and, and continued to intimidate him till they felt like they didn't need to intimidate him anymore, but he was very unnerved and, and, and felt like he escaped out of there. Uh, but that was his encounter uh, on the Illinois river in Oklahoma. So, uh, there's nothing in that encounter that to me doesn't sound plausible. So this is the, this is the beginnings of of my relationship with Ed Smith. And it was about me trying to listen to his information and trying to punch holes in it, trying to find flaws and, and things that don't make sense. And it just didn't happen. So let's get on with his story. We started off with uh, just basically jotting down notes that later turned into a rather extensive uh, written, almost a manual. And then we started breaking it out into sections as to where we wanted to go as far as with our, you know what technology was available in the day, what we could do with what budget we had. Um, and as we moved through time forward into the early 2000s, uh, more resources became available and more technology became available. So we started collecting in data and um, holding it for testing and some t in some instances actually even moving it through a testing process. <clears throat> so what brought us up to the time that um, we were getting close to basically to the end of this plan and we always had a plan of putting this together in a documentary. Um, but how can you compress? It became an, an issue of how do you, at that time it was eight years into it, how do you compress eight years of uh, research and eight years of data and eight years of uh, substance into, you know, a two or three hour documentary? <clears throat> So I want to throw in here at this point, uh, one of our conversations, you know, they had command trailers uh, and uh, angle iron 36 foot towers that would hold the uh, game cam or uh, thermal high dollar thermal cameras on top of these uh, huge towers. And uh, so that was the all of the things that they had in place, you know, uh, the time that he and I were on the phone and I, there's a lot of times that I would call him. So I called him and, uh, he said, you know, we'd already had discussions about them making the documentary. Uh, he had a need for, you know, they, they had a need for where they could store their equipment. Uh, you know, they had a property that they rented, that they were doing some research on and you'll hear him discuss that. But uh, I was talking to him on the phone one time and he said that they were looking at a warehouse to store all their stuff. And he was talking about needing sp space to film uh, with a, a big green screen and storage space for their command trailers. They had more than one command trailer and, and lots of equipment. And uh, so that all there was nothing out of the ordinary with that, but he said they were looking to lease a warehouse, and it was close to a, a, an airport. So I'm not sure which airport it would be, but I while we were talking on the phone, I could hear small engine planes in the background, sounded like they were doing touch and goes, um, you know, and a touch and go is just where you can hear it descend come down, just touch the ground a couple of times, and then take back off again, almost like a, uh, a, a, a pilot who, uh, who an amateur pilot who is trying to get their license uh, has to go through a series of touch and goes like 20 times till they learn how to land the plane just right. And, uh, or they have to do it so many times, but it sounded like I could hear that in the background. So he clearly was at an airport outside somewhere when we were discussing that and he was looking, they were looking at a, a warehouse to, to, you know, to rent or purchase. I can't remember if it was rent or purchase for their, for their 
their activities, the, the, the filming process and storage uh, capacity for all of their equipment and trailers. So it, just to have that happen at a random phone call, uh, if this guy was hoaxing, then he was able to create storylines on the fly that just that never stumbled on itself. Uh, and you're going to listen to him talk and, and, and when, as he's talking, very eloquent speaker, uh, clearly intelligent, you know, he may sound a little country, but, but to be able to put the storylines together and use the verbiage that he uses, you know, the communication level that he uses and talks about the technical aspects and things like that to me told me it was true or at least it's at, up to that point everything sounded true and so here we go let's go ahead and continue with what he says and letting the three volumes grow up to a certain point and then we just would at 10 10 years out release it um we decided that to go into the contact the MABRC because we had been looking into and researching uh, a number of groups that some came and went and some um, some probably should have went when they didn't but uh, <laughs> we ended up uh, deciding to go with the MABRC um, just because we like the philosophy of thinking outside the box and that's kind of really what the basis of our research is is thinking outside the box and thinking of what would be what we would consider to be innovative as to how to collect more information about these animals. Um, so when we brought the possibility up into the MABRC, um, a few things got misconstrued. We had a few things pulled off of the forum and shoved into other forums and just completely, you know, taken to the floor. And we decided at that point uh, to decrease any more of this really senseless bashing uh, that just gets in the way. So what he's talking about here is there were people on the MABRC forum that was taking some of the components of what he was doing and saying and laying out for us and taking it over to like the Bigfoot forum where, you know, they were really doing a lot of bashing and, things like that. And, you know, and that's just the way they were, uh, nothing wrong with that, but, but, you know, it just, sometimes you get tired of hearing that, that stuff. So that was one of the things that he's talking about there, uh, you know, is just what was going on over there at the BFR or the, uh, the Bigfoot forums. And, uh, so we're just going to go from there. Has, has gotten in the way for years. Uh, we would pull back and continue our work basically in, in the dark. And um, it worked for us before, and it's working for us again, and it's continuing to do it because we're almost done with our documentary now. Awesome. First awesome. One. Well, you know, Ed, I, you know, I, I, I want the listeners to understand <clears throat> my perspective. I have always been an information junkie. I mean, before I even got out into the field, I spent so much time in the library uh, so many hours online just looking into this subject. And when it came to the information that you were bringing forward, it, it, it satiated that craving of mine for new information. When you and I were having conversations on the phone, I mean, from the very beginning of you joining our forum, I mean, I was just so taken back by your approach, the, the technology that you guys were using. And, and to be honest with you, I was eating it up. And uh, it really didn't bother me. It seemed to bother people around me that, that, you know, they were getting so tantalizingly close to seeing what you guys had but never got to see the, the end product. It, it's hard to believe that that never really did bother me because I really did value your and my friendship and, and all the discussions that we had had and, and just how much I was loving hearing something that other people only wish they could hear as, as you and I were talking about some of the studies that you guys were doing. Uh, and, and so, of course, I want to thank you for, you know, uh, bringing well, me that's in. Kind of, that's why I was trying to post it into the forum and, and we was trying to become more open but of course unfortunately there are others that don't want that to happen right right yeah and and that is too true i mean that is so true and even amongst a small group you need everybody that thinks differently and my thought and i would hope everybody else 
kind of falls in line like I have, that eventually it's going to come out. I mean, don't get upset if, if it doesn't happen on your time frame. If it's out there, it's going to come out, and someday you're going to see what's out there. And, uh, and, and that brings it to the document's future release. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so what, what, is, what can we expect as an audience to see what we've so tantalizingly heard about in what you guys have? Uh, when, when can we expect to, to see something on screen for us? On a, as far as a release date? Yes. Is that what your question is? Okay, well, we're, we are, right now the final cut of the first volume is setting at right around 200, uh, well, two hours and, I think it's two hours and 54 minutes, something like that, before the end credits are added, and there's, so those aren't even done yet, which is kind of, you know, you have to credit everything and everybody. Um, so we have to take that and cut that down to two hours to fit a network commitment that um, we have to deliver on. Our original delivery date was the October 19th, just a few days ago. We've had to move that to November 9th because we just haven't been able to get get the product cut down to a, a two-hour time frame to allow the network to run it. And can you tell our listeners that the reason it needs to be a flat two hours is because it's going to a, a cable show which does not do commercials? Right. It's going into a cable network that does not it won't have any commercials on it. Um but we can't we we can't have it going over two hours. The thing is is to try and edit something down so you don't lose context of the information that's presented that will cause all kinds of issues and we know what those kinds of issues can become. Well, you know, um, we've got a co host here, uh, Reverend Stone, who is in the movie industry. Uh, he mm-hmm. can probably appreciate how you can pull one subject out, whether it be artistic drawings, and, and pull something out of the middle and have people expect to make that jump and not figure out how they got from point A to point B, C without right. B. Right. So. And that would cause even more issues, I would I yes. would think. Yes. So that's why we're trying to be very careful about how we cut and where we cut. And, some thing, and there may be complete incidents that we will have in the DVD version that won't be in the actual network version because there's no, the time just doesn't permit that. Well, that's one thing that I've, I've, I've always appreciated in your and my discussions, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I've, I've got a touch of OCD. That, that's why I'm, a, I'm a perfectionist in the job that I do in the fighting industry, uh, and, and I get that when it comes to details, the details in your documentaries, and you seem to be the one in charge of content and things like that, and, and you may have a bit of OCD, just like me. So, uh, but that, that's not a bad thing. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with trying to be perfect in what you're going to put out there. Well, I, I don't think perfect is the actual thing I'm going for. It's to alleviate the problems before they become problems or issues before they become issues, and um, I been a big believer in that the devil is in the details so maybe i am a little bit of that you know uh, ocd or or whatever but i'm i just want to try and alleviate as many problems or if that can become issues or issues that can become problems down the road whichever you want however way however you want to look at that yeah okay well that that Uh, effectively covers you know that you guys are are wrapping up the document which you claimed all along that you were going to be working on uh and, and and it, it's have been and still are, <laughs> and, and shortly in the future it, it, it's in, it, it'll be out. So that that's great. But I've also got a few questions I'd like to ask you about some of the things that we've talked about in the past. Without revealing too much information, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about possible DNA and tissue samples that may have been collected, uh, you know, in the Atoka area, and uh, okay. specifically how that, the chain of events with that DNA, how it was given to labs to, to be tested, and how that translated into discussions with academia. So he's about to talk about some tissue, blood and hair samples that were taken at, at a uh, farm incident in Atoka, the Atoka Colgate, Oklahoma area. Mm. Now, this involves, now I'm not very smart when it comes to computer CAD systems and things like that, but there were some CAD drawings, not quite sure what that means, 
but uh, they were very detailed and uh, originated, you know, off the computer where you had the you had uh, a topography view of this farm where the barn and locations they had footprints, measurements, and all every detail you can imagine in the investigation that they did on this uh, farm. It involves a barn. It involves uh, an incident where a pig torso was found in a tree with the head pulled off of the pig. And, you know, in, in the phone conversations with Ed, you know, he, you know, of course, they know the difference between a head that has been cut. There's no cuts, it, uh, a pulling of a head where there's tearing and ripping and pulling apart is a much different look than one that has been cut. So the head was pulled off of this pig. I can only imagine how difficult that would be. Uh, and the torso was found up in a tree. Now, mind you, the bullet maker video that I did involved a 400 pound steer up in a tree that I investigated and talked to the, the landowner, you know, and indeed there was one found, there was one up in the tree. So, so I, I do believe that is plausible and believable. Uh, but on this farm, uh, I mean, he's not going to tell you the details about the incident that brought them there to collect that tissue sample. But that, that's what I'm going to tell you now. The barn had hay stacked in it. The, the woman of the family went into this barn to get something one time uh, and something screamed at her from inside the hay. The half the barn was stacked up with hay. So there was this huge wall of hay and something inside the hay was screaming and making a ruckus or whatever. And so she backed out of the barn. Uh, she actually saw the hay kind of bulging a little bit. Something was clearly burrowed into the hay. Uh, so in the in investigation after that, the back side of the barn had a had a lean to, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a type of just a, a, a freestanding roof where you can park implements, farm implements underneath it, you know, hay balers, combines or whatever, you know, whatever, uh, tractors, you know, brush hogs, stuff like that. Uh, so this barn was no different. They had all that kind of equipment back there under this lean to. And within that area, something had peeled back the metal on the barn to get inside. And that's where the back side of the hay was. So it actually burrowed into the hay. And uh, when it exited, when the woman was in the barn at the same time and, and it was making its noise and then exiting out of the back side of the barn. They didn't know that the back side of the barn would, had been peeled open to create an opening uh, until later. But this thing exited that way, but it exited quicker than it anticipated because, because she had come in the barn and it was trying to get out of the barn. Well, apparently there was an exposed screw that it snagged itself on going out of that opening that it had kind of tore open. So you could imagine there's probably exposed screws. Well, it was one of those screws that, that got some body tissue, hair, and blood. So when he talks about collecting blood, hair, and body and tissue, it was from that one incident where a screw scraped the meat of a, of a shoulder or hand or arm or whatever. Uh, you know, and, and within the, the equipment on the back of that barn, on the CAD drawings they had where it was coming through and you could see where most of this equipment had a very thick layer of dust, farm dust, you know, from, from farming and stuff and the, all the dust in the air. So it was quite dusty and you could see the handprints where it was worming through the equipment to get back to that hole that it had pulled out on the back of that barn. So all of these details uh, drawn up in a CAD system, uh, I can't imagine how much time that would take. So you could, you could see how we would be bought into it at this point with the things that he was telling us. So let's get on with what happens with those blood samples and tissue samples. 
and uh, maybe universities, things like that, without giving out any names, can you kind of give us a pathway of how it went from laboratory to academia trying to get a hold of you to, to look into this? Okay, well, um, a little over a year ago, we got involved in a site down there in the uh, Toka Colgate um, region. And um, a lot of that can be read about on the archive, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time of going into the details of all that. Thank you. We had uh, collected um, samples, uh, both blood and tissue and hair. Um, those samples were uh, sent to 11 different labs uh, so we could maintain also a control pool of these samples because um, in, in doing this kind of research, you need to not only have your samples tested, but from that same sample set or location, you need to maintain a, a quantity as a control so someone else can test it. That is a, that's incredibly important because if you don't have that control, then you're only going off of what was initially collected. And right. I'd, I'd, like, is, I'd, I'd like to bring up one thing about you and my discussion. At that whole time frame when we were talking about tissue and, and the, the samples being tested, you said something to me that I thought was so brilliant. And that is that you said each of the 11 laboratories that this, uh, these samples were sent to did not know that they were being sent anywhere else. They thought they were the only place being sent these samples. And that was because you were looking to see if there was any type of attempt at any type of cover-up through government agencies sure. or anyone coming in. I thought that was as I, – I, I just thought that was brilliant. I never heard of, any, of, of anything going to that kind of never depth. Send them. You never send them, and we never sent them, but you should never send them as possible Bigfoot sample. You never do that. You send that as unknown specimen or unknown sample and give it a code number and, and, a, and a, basically a, a, a sample number. And that you can look that up in the, the archive as to how we do that. So, uh, well, and it's my understanding through one of those samples being tested, that's how you got in contact with the university. Can you, I mean, can you give us whatever you can about how okay. interesting that conversation must have been? Uh, <laughs> at a uh, regional university uh, down here, um, but in, you know, I'll, I'll just say regional because I don't want to. There's just too much to have to to fish through. Yeah. But uh, I um, I had an interesting conversation with um, basically the head of that department who did conduct a sample uh, or test on one of the samples or several of the samples out of our control pool. Um, and there was basically the look of um, when we gave, when he gave us his results and we brought in the results from the lab, which we had already tested, and he looked at both sets in front of him, I thought this man was going to turn white as a sheet of paper. And then when um, certain photos were shown to them of what, what was uh, accompanied that as to why, where these was, was collected and uh, the footprints and, and, and issues like that. Um, I, I he, he was actually, I, I don't think he ever put together what he was looking at until we threw the our lab's findings on the table with his. You know, and, and, and as, as you described that, how you put all of that together in one package, which would have several different aspects, it, it should be eminently important to our listeners that you you shouldn't just run forward with a footprint and say, look, there's a Bigfoot out here, or run forward with a hair, or run forward no. with a, a blurry photograph. When you put all this together and they overlap each other and connect together, it becomes a much stronger evidence. Yeah. Another thing I want to say about the Atoka, um, the Atoka evidence pool um, we was brought onto the scene of that. Um, we did not capture any electronic data while this event was going on as far as the incident. So I kind of hold that evidence pool at somewhat of a greater distance than some of the other evidence that we've collected with our, uh, not only with video and audio and, and data recordings and um you know, samples and physical evidence at the scene, uh, because we can actually say, well, this is what has been captured by the electronics as well as the the uh, 
genetic testing that was done on those samples. So I have to say that what we captured with the myriad of uh, devices and uh, technology that's out there versus what we have in the Atoka Colgate evidence pool, I don't hold, um, I, 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 say, I, can, I can say, well, take a look at that evidence in that Atoka pool and then take a look at the evidence that we have over here at, that we've captured with our electronics and, and uh, done genetic testing on and, and so forth and everything like that in that evidence pool. And that evidence pool is actually stronger than the Atoka evidence pool. However, we have more evidence in the pool from Atoka than we do a quantity of evidence. Not from any other single... Yeah, than what we have in our actual electronic capturing and, and all that kind of on those particular incidents. Well, in case there's any in case there's any listeners uh, going through the archives and listening to this show at a later date uh, and not listening now who have not listened to the previous show, uh, I just want to touch base on some of the other technology, not only high dollar thermal uh, cameras, but uh, we're talking we're talking uh, triangulation for sound. Uh, uh, you know the the sound towers that you guys had uh, uh, engineered by the uh, by the tech guy and oh, uh, the MIT guy. Yeah, yeah. You know those uh, how you guys are trying to make sounds to get locations. He's actually appearing in the documentary. Well, awesome! That is awesome. So uh, that and then because he and then actually, the feedback that goes into the computers, uh, you know that that from the ground sensors and shows that they're bipedal or quadruped. Yeah, and that's that's off the shelf technology. That was off the shelf stuff right there. Yeah, off the shelf not, with the military, but three together in the in the in one single package for for one animal going across the field and being able to put all of those together on the same animal I mean, is amazing. See, that that technology was developed for not just the military but for the um, corrections Department of Corrections, where they can uh, put ground sensors around their fencing. Wow. And don't know whether or not that it's a dog walking up to the fence or whether they got an escape yeah. walking up to the fence. So um, that's off the shelf. That was just adaptable. Wow. Well, that, that kind of segues into uh, my next question. You know, when we were talking about the, you uh, uh, keeping each lab uh, ignorant of the other labs testing the, the, the samples just to make sure that there was no funny business going on and, you know, no cover-ups or anything like that, uh, talking about – government or land, land management people. I know you and I discussed a certain area here in Oklahoma, and I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation as it was taking place where you guys had leased some private property and were doing some surveillance. Uh, you know, and, and remember, you know, you're talking about the, 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 the unmarked vehicles and the, the lights being positioned to kind of block you guys' camera. Can you, can you go yeah. over that story without... Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, we was... Uh, and there's, a, there's an area that is kind of over towards uh, BW's stomping grounds um, that we have leased on basically 500, around 500 acres. Um, that it's back in the deep woods, but there is a, uh, there's a wildlife preserve, and then right along that same line is basically a clear-cut um, high-voltage power right away. Uh, there had been reports by the owners of the land that they'd had some interesting going on, and we went out and we took a look and we kind of confirmed that. So we leased the property, and it is still under our lease um, that expires in 2012. Um, we went out there, set up our uh, observation to look at this clear cut, um, had some interesting target development. Um, and then on the uh, wildlife management side, I'd say probably about probably three or four weeks into our little endeavor, um, they had shut down that that area. Uh, you couldn't drive into the government side or the wildlife management side, and um, they had shut it down. Uh, and was basically um, not letting anybody in uh, into it, which we had actually drove back into it earlier in our in our investigation. Um, 
and we, the only reason we knew that they had shut it down was we tried to go back in and it was closed. And they had parked um, a couple of uh, wildlife, uh, basically, uh, game wardens out there. And we talked to them and we said, you know, what's the deal? And they, they gave us some kind of a brush off deal. We didn't really, you know, they're doing a population count or population study or whatever, you know, whatever excuse they could come up with because that was the two excuses that came from two different game wardens at two different times when we did ask them. So we said, okay. And I thought that was odd, but um, I didn't think any more of it. And we kind of went, well, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and kind of see what happens. Um, we had also um, visible light cameras, daytime cameras. We had uh, starlight cameras. We had uh, IR light cameras. Now, that's not the emitting kind. That is the the sort of light amplification um, camera technology in the IR spectrum. And then we also had thermal IR out on the side. Um, probably not if they're knowing that we actually had thermal out there at the particular targets we were looking at. But then uh, uh, we ended up having a, a nighttime incident when um, we started noticing that they were actually setting up look like a work site lights, you know, the kind of lights that uh, have the four groupings at the top and you have a like a generator base at the bottom and, and uh, you know, how you drive by certain work sites and they have the area completely lit up. Yeah, big spotlight trailers. Yeah, yeah, like basically. Um, and they started uh, lighting those up and shining them into the clear-cut area, which is not even wildlife management property. That right-of-way runs on private property. So we were like going, why are they trying to blind out this right-of-way that is in, in private property? That was just odd to us. Um, it did uh, impede our view of with our daytime cameras and our IR um, light cameras because of the IR light cameras are kind of pa they're passive, basically. They're kind of like a uh, a starlight, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and they'll produce. We were using them in hopes that we could <coughs> get uh, other images because the moon was almost full at this time, and it was clear. And uh, that that technology works really good in the full moon. Um, but when you hit us, they hit us with those kinds of lights. That really kind of negated those those instruments that we were using, with the exception of our thermal IR cameras, which we could go in and um, adjust the thermogram for the, uh, I don't know if some, if you get more information on the, the IR cameras, you can adjust the thermogram either as at the firmware, firmware level, which is at the camera, or using it uh, as software, or as a software package. The thermogram allows you to block out certain heat ranges or certain heat clusters or certain heat bands. Uh, that allows you to take out a lot of the distortion that's thrown off by uh, heat lamps or heat lights or, uh, you know, uh, fires or whatever whatever that heat source is. Uh, and then you also can adjust it to amplify uh, the uh, temperatures by color uh, from the background to look at cooler colors and, and uh, intensify those. But, and it's sort of like a, you're, you're, you're negating certain, the, the high heat areas and you're amplifying the low, the low heat areas, the cooler areas. So what that did is that it allowed the thermal cameras to actually look at um, with a certain sense of detail what was in essence going on. Um, I never saw, or we never saw, um, anything from these unmarked vans that were coming in um, to this area that I would call suspicious, like throwing food out or throwing any anything like that. But they would enter this, the enter the gate, 
with the approval of the game wardens, and how we knew this is we set up a game camera uh, sort of off and around the bin, sort of, I will say, covertly, and we got them on video allowing these these uh, vans to go through. But that's all we saw. We don't know. There's nothing that we can could come out and say, oh, well, guess what? We caught you. Um, and that's the problem. We, that it is just so suspicious. It's so it's so odd that I, I I mean we sat around we talked about it for oh probably the better part of a month as this was going on. But what happened was is that it drove off the activity that we were looking for. And I'm really I have to kind of say. Uh, I almost thought, and, and I'm probably the only one out of our group that thought this, that they kind of like knew we were there. They had to know we were there to put these lights out there. Now, I'm not a big uh, conspiracy person, okay, but this kind of pushed those those buttons and pushed those bounds for me. Yeah. Um, they could have been doing something completely benign. I, but we don't know. We simply don't know. Uh, we discontinued our operation um, after basically 53 days of them blaring these lights at us at night. So um, for them to keep that kind of thing up, then to, when we left the area, we had it under um, different observation. Um, and in three days, they quit turning their lights on. Mm. Well, hey, remember when uh, you said that the, the gentleman who let you lease the land, they the the game people came in and tried to purchase the land from him? Yeah, they, they tried to purchase the land within, I'd say, 11 days after the light started. They really were wanting to purchase yeah, that land. How could not be suspicious? That's just odd. It's just, I'm like, okay. I tell you what, I will counter. <laughs> we will find a way to counter their offer. We'll, we'll, if they want it that bad, we'll just push it up. And he didn't want to sell it. I mean, it's been in his family for years, you know. But, um, you know, like I said, we still have at least till 2012, and we will be returning to it. Okay, this is me interjecting into the storyline. This next gentleman uh, is from New Zealand. His name is Daniel Falconer, and he is asking a question of uh, Ed Smith. And uh, he was a member of the MABRC. Uh, these are pictures of him, of Daniel and myself, uh, researching down in Texas around that same time frame. And here's a picture of him uh, at his work desk. He uh, works on some pretty big films, Lord of the Rings, King Kong, uh, you know, uh, movies like that. Uh, he's one of the artistic art, art guys uh, from the, the Weta Workshop uh, in New Zealand. So uh, he's he's worked in some pretty big films and uh, very, very smart guy. Uh, he, he's a Bigfoot enthusiast. So he came over to the States to, to do a little research. And I was lucky enough to spend a couple of weeks with him. Uh, super nice guy. And uh, so he is the one posing this next question. Well, I'd love to say hi, first of all, Ed. It's great to talk to you. Finally, in person, we've swapped, swapped the odd post and PM on the forum, so it's nice to, to get to say hello. I'm so glad you were able to make it because um, I have been impressed with, well, not just your artwork, but with your uh, comments and insights as to what we, how we, how all of us, as far as you know, Bigfoot researchers, believers, and open-minded skeptics and i'm i'm really you know okay with open-minded skepticism because we have to be able to question ourselves as to whether or not we're doing it the right way or you know do we have something and so i'm really i'm really glad you made it thank you very much uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun so far i'm learning a lot and having a really good time so and you got you picked a great day time of the year to come it's not too hot and it's not, yeah, <laughs> not no. hopefully cold it's not too many bugs um well, I'm, I'm obviously very curious about what we're going to see 
in these uh, in these documentaries, and you mentioned that there's a there are any multi parts. So I imagine that that means that you guys will have to hold some stuff back. You know, yeah. how much um, are you able, are you at liberty to say without obviously going into specifics? In generally speaking, how much we're going to see even hinted at in the first one, and how much we you know we're going to need to wait to see. You're going to you're going to see um, in the first doc, the first documentary really is going to be about our first three years, in essence, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, some of the latest stuff, as far as um, some of our thermal work and stuff like that, that will also be included uh, as, as basically um, highlighting and bringing forward, you know, basically our our end goals. Um, but yes, we will. You will also see. Um, Basically, the money shots. I would, I would you know, put that, put, put it out like that. You're going to see the thermal hits that we get. Wow. Uh, the things that we cannot, um, we just simply can't explain. And uh, it's one thing um, when you're sitting there in the research trailer and you see the. So before you see it, you you're going to hear it moving through the brush. That's what the the audio the uh, sound towers do for us. Um, it also helps to try and lo- that that will try and help to locate the the movement. If it has to be close to our ground sensors, then that's double confirmation that there's something out there. And if it's both, if it's enough data in the ground sensors, then you know you got either got something like a a cow that's walking. In a, you know, in quadruped, or you got something walking in a biped mode, and um, that's double confirmation of something happening. Then, if it's at a long range, then maybe we have a you know, uh, it's probably not in the daytime; it's more nocturnal. Then maybe we'll have a you know, we'll be able to show show the uh, from another camera point a uh, a starlight image of that particular event that's happening. Um, and then if it does get it within our, our thermal uh, capabilities, then you have a thermal hit. And that becomes quadruple. you got four different data sets coming in electronically that something's there. Yep, that paints a very, very compelling picture. And that's trackable. So you know basically the, the line that it took you go out there and you start doing your field investigation looking for signs like hairs in a tree, footprints, cast them, um, whatever it may have left. Uh, so there's another set of evidence that comes into play. Something that happened, something moved through the area or, um, how should I say, or accosted a trailer that may have been set out there, which I don't know if you remember uh, reading the the crybaby, um, mm-hmm. uh, the crybaby experiment we did. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, that will that that part will part of that will be in the first and the, and part of that will be in the second because of uh, some uh, interesting developments that came out of that. Um, but that, that footage will be in there too. You just you just have to keep stacking the evidence together, and you and you cannot you cannot rely on a single footprint. You cannot rely on one piece of uh, footage. You cannot rely on one photo. You cannot rely on uh, a sound recorded. You've got to try and capture all of it. Yeah. The only way to do that is to blanket an area that they may be moving through. I was going to ask, what what kind of a reaction are you anticipating when this um, when this comes out? I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm sure we'll get a tremendous amount of criticism. <laughs> I'm quite prepared for that. It is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm quite prepared for it. Uh, but you know, uh, we're going to have a lo- a website that um, people will be able to go into, take a look at the raw footage. Um, there's also in the DVDs, if they have people will wait that long, um, we will also put in a data DVD in the actual package, and uh, there'll be 
uh, the data sets from our investigation, from also our uh, audio diaries and our video diaries from those particular in incidents that are uh, showcased, or is so to speak, in the documentary. So there will be a lot of behind the scenes stuff that that will hopefully help explain why we did and how we did it. That's awesome. Uh, I think that's that's very exciting for you know someone like me who's really an enthusiast more than a researcher to just to have access to all that background information that obviously, you know, for, for very obvious reasons, when you put together a documentary, all that stuff gets trimmed out. So it's, it's great that you guys are going to include that. Well, uh, if, if you go back, Daniel, to, and, and I don't know if you listened to the archive show. Oh, yes. I, that was a point that I made oh. that I really hate about documentaries of yep. dealing with this particular subject matter, or really any subject matter that's, you know, quote unquote, so, controversial. Yeah. So many of these documentaries are are more just, you know, they're entertainment more than more than meant to inform. Sure. Uh, and obviously, sure. what you're talking about is something very, very different that has real research value. Um, and well, so, obviously, you're you're trying to do the very best you can. Um, I mean, if it, well, what you, I mean, what you're saying sounds fantastic. So I, I really hope that um, that it that it does because it, it sounds like it could it could move this research forward. Tremendously to a next to the next level, if, you know, if it can withstand the scrutiny and uh, and it all, all stacks up. So I mean, I have very high hopes, and I'm extremely enthusiastic about it. Well, I, I want to thank comment. you obviously for bringing this forward. And uh, well, I would hope that in some someday we'd actually be able to sit down at a table and go through some of the uh, information that uh, you know. You can't fit everything into even a, a two hour and you know, 54-minute documentary. You know, it's for what we have in our archive. <laughs> I say we're going to do three of them. Well, maybe three is not enough. I don't know. I I just want to do get this first one done, and then the very next day I get the contract for the second one. So the the company has uh, uh, pushed our timetable by almost a factor of 12 months. Wow. And uh, I'm like, okay. Um, I just got through trying to, do, to get this one together, and I haven't quite finished that. Um, so I'm like, and, and you know, the guys are standing around, you know, with, you know, shock looks on their face. Yes. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know in my industry what that means. So I can, yeah. That's it. <laughs> But another thing is um, you achieve a certain level of burnout. You know, I've been, you know, we've been doing this for, I'm kind of, uh, we have a philosophy, and that is um, basically our philosophy is just do it, get it done, and don't let anybody or anything get in your way. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that sounds steamrollerish, so to speak, but it also, that's our drive. That's how we make things happen. And I was, if we didn't think that way, then I, you know, I think I don't think we would ever be to the point that we're at right now. Do you think? Um, do you, I know that uh, you you had a pretty profound encounter early on, and um, do you think you could have ever gotten to this place without having had that encounter, without having had that surety before you began this journey? Well, I think I know I was very driven after that. Because yeah. I'd always had it into my in my mind to do something, to try and and you know to bring to the uh, bring to the table. And I don't want to say bring to the public because that is not really what we want to do. Bring to the table something that would say, okay, someone someone could pick up and go down the line and with and go, oh, you know, pick it up, you know, get out there and go go really live with them if you want to put it that way, or you know, make it their their uh, work like uh, uh, good all did. Um, just just to get the ball rolling in the scientific world, That's that was, you know, they're there, they're living, they're breathing, and, um, you know, we have, we have, I want to, I want to have more open-minded skepticism, and I, I try to, I'm trying to, to, uh, how should I say this? I'm trying to stem some of my animosity towards skeptics, but at the same time, I know I'm going to beat them over the head with some of the stuff that comes coming down the 
line on this, so what we've been doing. So I'm okay with that. I really, you know, because you, you've seen what happens out there to someone who tries to bring evidence forward. They get ripped to shreds. And, and I think a lot of the people get scared off that may have very good evidence that just don't want to give it, put it up there for review because they've seen what happens to other people. And I'd like to try and, um, with what we're doing, I'd like to try and stem that flow of, of people being, you know, bashed into just... Well, you know, in theory, if the evidence you're bringing forward is strong enough, it should withstand that. But I, by the same token, I imagine that means you're still going to have a pretty thick skin to weather it all in the meantime. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I'm not know. in a hurry to go looking for evidence and bring it forward because I'm not sure I have thick enough skin to weather it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I call myself an enthusiast and not a researcher. Well, that, that's, yeah. uh, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, and you know what it's like out there. So yeah, they can keep that, uh, keep that all in in balance when you when you uh you know take things into consideration. Have you guys observed any behavior that you found surprising? Uh, I can say that um uh tree knocking is a pretty much a foregone conclusion. Um yep. and rock throwing. Hmm. You no, know, there's always those speculations as to well they don't throw rocks or they don't bang trees. Well, that question will get answered. <laughs> so wow. that part I think we're okay with. Um, I I think I'm most surprised by their ability to hunt and their abilities to, how shall I say, um, trick, if not lure their their prey into a situation where they can best take advantage of their target, uh, their food target. That's it's just uh, it uh, just amazes me as to how um, how they can do that. It, it's really <clears throat> Now, I'd like to say for as far as luring the prey animal, let's just say it's a deer. Uh, and I was talking to Ernie DeVoe about this. Uh, and there's evidence to suggest that some of these bows that you see where uh, a tree is bowed over and tied down so that it creates a low bow. There might be a typical blind situation set up in close proximity to something like that because the deer will come up a game trail and usually have its head on a swivel, uh, ears out, eyes looking around, uh, very alert. But when it comes, when it's going up a game trail and it has one of these bow overs, it has to bring its head down, go go through with its head down and that is when it's the most vulnerable that's interesting uh, I did not realize that was a thing until Ernie described that to me and, and that sounds amazing that <clears throat> at all the moments that a deer is paying attention until it has to go under one of these bows and its head is down and it gets you know disoriented momentarily that's that's the moment of attack or rushing it. That's fantastic. Really, it leaves me speechless. Wow. Um, and and I would also like to preface that by saying I always thought that had to do with the with the infrasound, but I'm not quite sure that that's what the, they're using. I, I, and I don't, I don't have an explanation for what they're using uh, outside. Their, maybe they just, they just know each other's movements at the same time. I, 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 and they, maybe that's how they train themselves to operate. I don't know. Hey, Ed. But, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, we've got a, uh, we've got a special guest standing here with us. Who's going to be speaking at the conference tomorrow? Are you familiar with? 
Scott Nelson and his study with the Sierra Sounds uh, uh-huh. audio. Yep. He's here, and uh, he's got a question he'd like to ask you if, you're, if you don't mind. No problem. Hi, Ed. Hello, Scott. Hey, I was just wondering, in, in um, all of the evidence that you've collected, do you have anything at all that would sound like chatter or any type of um, uh, a language? Okay. Um, I can say that if you want to call it a language, maybe a series of of clicks uh, and uh, oomph whistles, but I'm not sure if that would be what I would consider a language. However, when we were doing our um, abandoned camp experiment back in, I think it was 2004. Just say that any anything you collect uh, uh, vocally, you know, is going to be uh, valuable for you know future linguistic research as well. Right. Um, and when we release our, our uh, incident reports, our impacts, then we um, all that audio is in there. So you'll have all right. a lot of time to pour over it, and maybe you can pick something out of it that we haven't. Um, and you're more than welcome to, to highlight that, and whatever we do capture, I'll certainly pour forward on to you. All right. Um, well, I'd love to take a look at no it. Problem with that. But what I want you to look for in specific Okay, uh, we did, a, and, and Randy could probably tell you about it. It was an uh, abandoned camp, that experiment we did, where we played certain languages. We set up mannequins, set up tents, set up dirty laundry, set up phony fires, and well, set, well, phony fires, but fires, and, you know, made it look like a camp. Wow. Um, and then put cameras in, in the perimeter, and um, in one instance hung them kind of vertically over the, the camp itself and then left it for uh, over basically over nine weeks. But we, what we would do is have it on a uh, boom box um, mm-hmm. inside the tent. <clears throat> we would have it on a timer. Uh, we have a, a, about five 12-volt batteries hooked up in a series, or, uh, pardon me, parallel. That way that uh, it would have power for a good period of time. And um, it would play... Um, uh, one time it would play, uh, one week it would play like conversational uh, ger- uh, conversational German or conversational French in the next week wow. just to see what we would get as far as actual responses. Hmm. The best response we got was when we played conversational Japanese. Really? That's when we had, um, we had them that, that's rock. Right. Thing because uh, one of the first things that that um, I shared with a colleague of mine who was a, a native Japanese speaker um, was a a word that shouted on the the Moorhead tape uh-huh. that in in an ancient form of Japanese meant uh, caution or danger. Hmm. Well, uh, I don't know Japanese, and uh, nor do I. I. Just thought, I just <laughs> thought it was odd that we got. More, more activity and more responses um, when we played the conversational Japanese than any other conversational language that we pumped out there. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and and I'll, I've, I'm sure that you'll get that information when that comes up. I'll try and make that a point. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, now that was just, uh, you know, uh, a s- small podcast where he talked about just a couple of incidents. Uh, you know, the, the 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 land where they were renting next to the uh, wildlife management area and the happenings there, and as well as the uh, Atoka Colgate uh, blood, uh, hair, and tissue sample extraction. <clears throat> so... Now I'm going to have to talk to you about one of the discussions that, uh, you know, as this unfolded for another year or so before it came to an end, we were having a discussion uh, about a a purchase of some land. Ed, Ed and his group was looking to purchase a large chunk of land down in the Kaimichis. 
and uh, set it up, establish it, even, you know, bring in equipment and, uh, you know, dig a, a lake uh, and, and what type of uh, fauna to plant and set it up, you know, for heavy, for heavy deer use, you know, deer being the prey. Uh, so they wanted to kind of set this up as like a deer sanctuary area to provide a, uh, you know, a, a, a good hunting area for the Bigfoots and then set up their equipment there and own and own the property. So we had extensive conversations about that and how to develop it and, you know, the, the, what would be best and, you know, and the lay of the land and things like that. So me and DW were going to meet up with uh, Ed one. We had never met up with him face to face. And uh, we we all made plans to meet up at a restaurant, but he was going down to the Kaimichis. Uh, they were looking at some land. Uh, we'd been talking about it for quite a while. So he said on his way back up into into uh, Tulsa or wherever they were, wherever they were based out of, uh, that we would we would all meet up and meet face to face. And so uh, I think we met at a, at a steakhouse or a buffet or something. And uh, Ed pulled up in a, at the time, it looked like a relatively new dually diesel truck. And uh, I mean, every bit of a $75,000, $80,000 truck. And that was back in 2010. So, you know, when when you see a $75,000, $80,000 truck, that, that was one of the most expensive trucks you could see back then. I mean, not today, but back then. So anyway, so it was a really expensive truck and it fit the storyline that they had these big command trailers, you know, that they had to move into position and stuff like that. So he had this kind of truck that, that made sense to me. Nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, a show that I just listened to that DW did with uh, Steve Coles, he mentioned that we took a photograph of him. That's not true never took a photograph of us standing there uh just just didn't happen so i don't even know where that story came from we did say later i did say later that i wished i would have taken a picture of his truck and got the license plate so that we would have his license plate information that's the only thing i ever said later about a a, a, fo a photograph but for some reason the details got get changed when when DW tells a story and it became a we had a photograph of him and then I lost it somehow by not being tech savvy enough to transfer the picture over on online or something just complete poppycock. Uh, so, anyways, needless to say, we're at this restaurant and uh, he's got an attaché case and we're uh, we're at the tables. And here's where it gets interesting. He goes up to the buffet to, you know, to, to load up his food. I mean, he seemed like a nice enough guy. We, we were chit chatting conversations were cordial, cordial. And, uh, when he went up to the buffet, I get to looking at his attache case sitting there by his chair. And I just told DW, I said, I said, I'm going to open up his case and look in there. Was I wrong? Sure. Yeah. But, uh, I was determined to, to investigate it the best I could. Uh, so I put it up on a chair and popped it open under the table, but, you know, just right there beside me. And I, I opened it up and there was a bunch of paperwork in there. And right there on the top was a uh, register of deeds, uh, a land, uh, a land title. And it looked like it said Kaimichi. I didn't have that much time. I just looked at it and, and then I popped it closed, but, I was looking at some kind of register of deeds or, or title of land ownership of Kaimichi land. Uh, and he had just come up from down there. So did he know I would look, if, if this was a hoax, did he know that I would be looking in his attache case? Did he bring that attache case hoping that I would look into it? If everything that he had done up to that point was just to hoax us. It, it, to me, it just 
borderline ridiculous that 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 much effort would be put in to what end? What did he gain from that? Look at what's being said and done and, and what my own eyes see and whether it's believable or not. So up to that point, everything can be believed. It's it, There was nothing out of the ordinary. Even when you throw questions at him, he seems to have the answer for everything. You know, he, he, he seemed to have a little bit of knowledge of, of all of it. Uh, you know, when it comes to the, the camera systems and the layouts and all of that stuff. So now this next uh, episode that I'm going to interject into the story deals with the property of Bullet Maker. Now, you can check out my video that I called uh, Doug Bilby Chronicles or whatever. It's, it's, it's a video that I did about uh, Doug Bilby, Bullet Maker's property. Anyways, uh, the height of the activity at Bullet Maker's property was in the middle of all of this happening uh, with uh, Ed Smith. So there came a time when uh, we all talked about him setting up some equipment out there at Bullet Maker's property. And so the idea the only way to get into that bean field at a uh, bullet maker's place was through a single lane gate that opened up from the main road. And it was just a ruddy, muddy path going to the bean field. Uh, so you may have to uh, do your homework and, and go watch that video if you want to be more familiar with that bean field area where all of our activity was centralized around on the bullet maker's property. Well, anyways, uh, Ed was talking about moving uh, his command trailer and setting up some of their towers on the property uh, via the bean field, the hidden bean field area. So in order to do that, he said that they, they, he would probably have to modify the gate system to a double gate to get the big command trailer in there and and gravel it so that uh you know they didn't have to worry about mud being an issue so he he was willing to put a better double gate system in there and gravel it up to the uh hidden bean field in order to get the equipment in there now bullet maker ran a hunting lease on his property so that was uh his source of income uh and this project was going to overlap some of the hunting season and that was bullet maker's main concern so he inquired about uh being uh reimbursed uh from ed smith uh you know for you know monies recouping monies lost during his main source of income which was the hunting hunting season so that's reasonable uh but to hear dw tell the story it's all oh, well Bullet Maker demanded half the half the profits from the CDs. You know that's just DW trying to vilify Bullet Maker when when he's you know kind of not getting the facts right, embellishments and twisting of the facts, and just 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 not being real honest. And that you know that that's never set well with me. The the dishonesty. So the fact is uh, that's what happened. And so it fell apart and it upset me because I thought, well, if Bullet Maker would have just waited, then if if rather than throwing up a roadblock to get reimbursed for monies that he thought he would lose from the hunting lease, if you just let it play out at some point, Ed Smith would have pulled up with a command trailer and uh, the towers all ready to go at that gate, ready to make modifications. And, and we'd see the trailers and we'd see the outfit in action. And I think that's what we wanted to see. We wanted to see, you know, so far we could believe what we were being told, but we hadn't seen anything with our own eyes. I had met Ed and I had seen the vehicle that he drives. So it was slowly coming to the point where we were seeing things, but I wanted to see a command trailer. Uh, I wanted to see some others. And I thought getting it there on Bullet Maker's property would, would be the final 
stage where we could totally believe what Ed Smith was telling us because we'd see his equipment. That was important to me. But unfortunately, that unfolded rather quickly because Bullet Maker can be a little cantankerous. And when he wasn't getting the answers that he wanted uh, as far as uh, you know the payment or how he could be paid for you know whatever lost well, lost earnings he would get from uh, the the hunting lease, that fell apart really quickly. And then that was kind of like the beginning of the end of us with uh, Bullet Maker too. You know, uh, once he turned cantankerous about it, and then you know DW goes about it the way he does, which is very antagonistic and you know cutting people down and you know deriding people and you know twisting the facts and saying things about people, you know, trying to elevate himself. So that all kind of turned south and that was the end of that. So, so anyways, that is what happened at Boltmaker's place. It came very close to happening there. And uh, now we'll move on to the uh, final stages of this process. Uh, things move forward and they're doing things. Well, you did hear it when he was speaking that uh, there was an issue where some of their stuff was being pulled off of the MABRC over to the Bigfoot forums, and there was a lot of bashing going on. And that caused a little bit of issue between Ed and the rest of his original six crew, where they, you know, they, they weren't ready for that yet. Uh, you know, they were, and I think there was a little bit of a, a tiff between ed and them because they started being disappointed that he was sharing too much stuff with us so eventually it came to where there was a breakup of the original six and the the team that was left or the team that took over was called quantra the quantra team after that uh and and uh I am going to post, I'm going to read some of the things that uh, Ed said about the, uh, you know, about how he received the information. He was still on the uh, flash system, uh, message system to the group when they said that they had the daisy in the box. Daisy in the box was uh, the code, the code name for Bigfoot captured. And this all entailed uh, a a trap that involved, uh, I mean, I don't know how they disguised the trap or whatever, but they had it on set up in, in, in the woods somewhere, and it had a pressure plate on the floor. Uh, I mean, Ed had the dimensions of the box. He had the weight of the box. He had the weight of the box empty. He had the weight of the box with the pressure plate. and and the, the you know the gas tanks they 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 I don't know what kind of gas they were using, but it was set for a pressure point of about 350 pounds because they didn't want to get they didn't want to have any wild animal go in there and just go through this you know system of being gassed and and unconscious and then you know have a couple of deer in there. So they had they had the floor pressure on the floor set up for about 350 pounds may have been 500 pounds i don't remember the exact number i just know that the number was fairly high uh to eliminate any other animal coming in there and not having to worry about being captured uh, and it was set up to flood the container with a gas render the subject unconscious and then quickly exhaust the gas and bring back in the oxygen so that it, the the subject wouldn't die so it every time we'd throw a question at him asking him about certain things it, he ha he had an answer for everything so it, it was hard for us to wrap our head around the fact that we were being hoaxed uh so so then later when uh he he claims that uh still being a part of the message system flash drive or whatever that they received the message that they had a daisy in the box. He said that uh, he's going to assume that they had a specimen and were, were going through the protocols that were already set in place where it was going to be studied for like two days and then released 
and uh, going to be part of a documentary and all that stuff. So it was a very exciting, very exciting, uh, you know, few days when all of this transpired. And, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, things were coming to a head. Uh, they wanted to get together a bridging team, uh, a, a team of people. And he, for some reason, let DW put the team together. So he's putting in Abe Del Rio, <laughs> Steve Coles, and, uh, you know, of course, Meldrum at the time was top dog. So, you know, that that that's cool. Uh, Melissa Hovey and Kathy Strain. So uh, I would agree to Meldrum and Kathy Strain, given their credentials. Everything else was just uh, the buddy system. Hey, you're my buddy, so I'll, I'll get you in on the team. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, because uh, they've been friends ever since. And, uh, you know, Steve never expects too much truth from DW either. So, uh, anyways, that was the bridging team, myself and DW included. Uh, certainly, I should have been in it, but only because of my relationship with Ed at the time. Uh, I've been the one completely in uh, uh, co phone communication with him every day we were we were talking every day it seemed like uh and and i would call him uh, it was it, it was never off the table that i couldn't call him and, and and i would call him at odd times and uh i called ed one morning it was early it was about seven in the morning it was before i went to work and i was calling him because i was going to clarify some stuff from a conversation that we had the night before and here's where it gets interesting. Some gentleman answers the phone or some guy answers the phone and sounded like he was sleepy. And uh, and it was the phone number that I had called forever and spoke with Ed. So it was Ed's phone. And when I said, hey, I said, is, is Ed there? And he goes, hold on. And he, and he gave Ed the phone. It sounded like they were in bed, like early morning. One was laying next to the other and, hey, Ed, here's the phone, somebody, you know. And then when Ed got on the phone, that's when I knew. And uh, and so I said, hey, Ed, I said, man, I said, this is odd. I considered myself and Ed to be friends at that time. It had been a three or four year friendship. Lots and lots of phone conversations. I felt like I knew him pretty good. So I just told him, I said, look, man, I said, I'm just going to say this because of what just is what just happened now. And the question mark that we have with with his reluctance to ever go public, his reluctance to let people see who he was because he didn't want his life looked into. He was he was more interested in pushing information onto us and letting us move forward with it is what it seemed like, which to me I thought was odd until that moment. And I said, I said, Ed, I said, I consider you my friend. I said, I never want you to feel uncomfortable about anything. I don't I, I, I and I said, but I've got I'm gonna have to say this because I I, I think it's probably true. I said I said, are, are you gay? <laughs> and there was a long pause. And he goes, yes. And I said, I said, man, I said, well, I'm glad we got this out on the table. I said, don't worry about it. Don't, I said, don't even think twice about it. I said, I feel bad that you ever thought that you had to hide that from me. And I said, now that answers questions for me that I've had about why you've been so reluctant to to stamp your name on this project to where people can scrutinize your life and look into your personal life because that's what's going to happen that's the moment it all made sense to me that he was protecting his own personal space by not putting himself out there and and we, on the other hand, was taking that as a big red flag of him being a hoaxer. So 
not everyone had that information, but at that moment, I had that information. Later, I revealed it to DW, and of course, he used it in a very derogatory, negative way when he's trying to vilify somebody. Uh, but, you know, so up to that point, uh, you're going to have to listen to what was said. You're going to have to do a little research and go look at some of the archives of, you know, the things that, that he posted. Some of it was brilliant. It was detailed. It was well thought out. And uh, I think it's going to, I still scratch my head of why someone would spend four years doing podcasts with us, talking about subject matter, you know, all of the technology and the cameras. And if it was all made up, but he spoke about it so eloquently, like he, like, like he believed it. And didn't stumble over his words, didn't mince words. We'd throw questions at him that he could answer on the fly. I'm telling you, it made it, there's nothing about that to me that screamed red flag. The red flag is just at the end where it all fell apart and we didn't, we have never seen anything from that. But where is, where is the, uh, where is the stumbling and the lying and the and and the parts where we should have discovered that this was a hoax way sooner than the very end of it but it never happened just 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 didn't see it so i hope you take my point of view of of everything that happened with ed smith and i mean we call him a hoaxer because we didn't see anything at the end, but I still don't know because I, uh, he, he did a good job of, of snowing me over if that's indeed what was done. I, I can't imagine spending four years snowing someone over all the phone conversations at, at after hours, early morning, you know, in different situations, constant phone chats for four years and all of the time he spent on the forums going over details and CAD drawings and, and things like that. And, and just to what end, what did he gain from that? He, he gained absolutely nothing. He, he put that much effort and work so that he could say, Hey, he, 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 he jacked us over. Where's he at now? He's been gone for 10 years. We haven't seen him or heard from him. So he, he had, there's nothing that has perpetuated his popularity after that or gained anything from that. That doesn't make any sense to me. It still doesn't make any sense. So there you have it. Interesting, isn't it? All right. Please like and subscribe. And I I have a feeling I'm going to get some questions on this one. Uh, but yeah, throw me the questions and let's get this thing. Uh, let's get this. Let's chat about this. And uh, I mean, I wish I I wish I still had his phone number. I'd I'd like to talk to him and find out, you know, <laughs> what he's doing and where he's at in life. Uh, so okay, well, that's it then. Thank you.